Good morning. Uh, good morning to all participants and faculty of Karachi Spine 2020. I really wanted to be with you, but uh, my brother Salman knows the reasons I uh, um, was not able to, uh, to be with you. So uh, alternatively, the only way was um, to record this and send it to you and then open discussion with you over Skype. And I'm, I'm really honored to be one of the, uh, uh, of the speakers and the faculty of this prestigious course, Karachi Spine 2020. It's, uh, it's prestigious not only um, uh, because it's run by um, uh, some of the best um, spine surgeons in the world, but it has a lot of traditions um, that has been running for years and years. And uh, my brother and uh, dear friend uh, Salman Sharif, the, uh, the vice president, and uh, he's going to be the president of the World Spinal Column Society uh, in the very near future, is uh, uh, the man behind all this work, uh, all these traditions that made it uh, one of the most prestigious spine courses in the world. Uh, my first presentation this morning to you is going to be about idiopathic scoliosis, the adolescent type. And um, uh, throughout the presentation, uh, you are going to hear my voice, um, uh, uh, recording my notes on the slides, and then at the end, I'm going to see you again. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, uh, I will open discussion uh, with you. Uh, and I'm happy to receive any questions and I'll answer them all. Okay, so uh, uh, this is um, uh, my first presentation uh, to Karachi Spine 2020. I have 15 minutes, but I have to tell you, um, uh, first of all, I'm uh, apologizing for my partially lost voice because uh, I have some common cold. Uh, uh, and I'm, I can uh, reassure you that this is not coronavirus. I've, uh, I've checked myself. Uh, this is uh, the main administration building of, uh, of Ain Shams University, and uh, uh, these are my dear friends uh, Doug Orr and Andy Wakefield when they visited me um, a few weeks ago in, uh, in Cairo, Egypt for uh, the Egyptian Spine course, uh, Egypt Spine um, uh, 14 and 15. And uh, um, uh, my office uh, uh, sits here. Uh, this is my, my uh, one of the balconies of, uh, of my main office as the vice president uh, of Ain Shams University. And this is the accreditation of Ain Shams University by, uh, by QS. Uh, this is the QS stars uh, that we have. We have four stars out of five stars. Um, uh, I'm honored uh, to be with you in Karachi Spine 2020. And sorry for my uh, physical uh, absence, but uh, I hope I, um, I can give uh, some uh, useful information uh, to revise uh, this um, matter with you. Uh, and that would be uh, a good compensation, I think, uh, for, uh, for not being able to, uh, to come here. Uh, scoliosis in general is defined as a coronal uh, spinal curvature uh, of at least 10 degrees with the rotation of the vertebral bodies. This is the uh, the common um, uh, definition for, uh, for scoliosis. Uh, but we have to note all the time that it's a three-dimensional deformity. It's not a lateral curvature. It's a lateral curvature uh, with, uh, with some rotation. So usually it's a three-dimensional thing. Uh, and this is the, uh, the bending test that I'm going to show you, but, but I can, I, um, uh, I, I'm putting this to see uh, that if, uh, even if, if you um, uh, have this, uh, this cut to the, uh, to the uh, thoracic cage, uh, you can see the, the amount of rotation uh, that can cause this clinical picture. Uh, but let's concentrate on the adolescent uh, idiopathic scoliosis that we are going to talk about uh, today. It's, uh, it's the idiopathic scoliosis in, uh, in children from 10 to 18 years and it's the most common type of scoliosis. Uh, the incidence is 3% for curves uh, between 10 to 20, 0.3% uh, for curves more than 30, so um, uh, the severe uh, cases are less frequent, um, thank God. Uh, for um, the curves uh, more than 30, uh, females to male uh, ratio is 10 to 1, 
but it's one to one male to female ratio for small curves. Uh, so females are taking uh, the whole burden of, uh, of the severe um, uh, kind of disease and the right thoracic uh, curve uh, is the most common. Um, <clears throat> the, the path of physiology, uh, there are a lot of, um, uh, of uh, theories um, uh, what is really causing uh, this idiopathic scoliosis, but, but you can say that it's not known. Uh, the theories uh, could be um, uh, a brain, brain stem problem, uh, proprioception disorder, uh, hormonal, uh, which is um, some uh, high mixture of uh, how melatonin will work with uh, calmodulin uh, and the effect of that on platelets. It's highly complicated and it needs uh, almost um, a day to talk about it. And also uh, the abnormal development of the neurocentral uh, synchondroses, which is this area, which is a cartilaginous plate that forms between the centrum and the posterior arch, and it closes uh, in the cervical area at um, around six years, 12 years for the lumbar, and uh, 14 to 17 years, years in the thoracic spine. And uh, any abnormal development around this area can cause uh, this uh, scoliosis. And in most cases, there is uh, a positive family history. <coughs> Sorry again for, for all these voice problems. <coughs> uh, prognosis. <coughs> the natural history um, um, uh, is that there is increased uh, incidence of acute and chronic pain in adults if it's left untreated. That's why it's important uh, to talk about it and to try and treat it. And curves more than 90 degrees are associated with cardiopulmonary dysfunction, early death, pain, and decreased self-image, which is a, a, a real huge problem with, with a lot of psychological problems uh, for those kids. Curve progression, uh, we will talk about this later, but um, 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 the, the more um, uh, the curve, um, especially uh, before skeletal maturity, if it is more than 25 degrees, uh, it tends to progress. And uh, after skeletal maturity, there is no much progress. Uh, for curves that, that are more than 50 degrees, it's about uh, one to two degrees per year. And for lumbar curves, uh, uh, more than um, uh, 40 degrees would have the same uh, progression rate. Uh, risk factors include um, uh, also um, uh, remaining skeletal growth. Uh, the younger the age, the more signs that there is uh, still more growth to come, uh, like riser sign, uh, open triradiate cartilage, um, uh, the, the more uh, chance for, uh, for progression of the curve. And um, uh, the peak growth velocity, uh, which is one of the best predictors for curve progression, it's for females around menarche. And if the curve is more than 30 degrees before peak uh, height velocity um, uh, around the, uh, the age of menarche, it's, uh, it's more, li uh, more likely um, to need surgery. Also the curve type, the thoracic is more likely uh, to progress uh, than lumbar, and the double curves are more likely to progress than single curves. And we are going to uh, to know uh, what these curves uh, are about uh, in a few seconds. Uh, there are some important definitions that I have to give. Uh, first of all, what is a structural curve and non-structural curve? Structural curve is the fixed, non-flexible, and uh, uh, the one that fails to correct with bending. Non-structural curves are not fixed, but flexible and readily correct with bending, even if partially. Uh, how uh, these children are going to be presented, uh, uh, if there is effective uh, school screening, this is usually uh, the, the case. Uh, and uh, physical examination will tell you if this is um, a scoliosis related to uh, like uh, limb length discrepancy. Uh, or uh, it is a real fixed curve uh, with the special tests like the Adams forward, uh, forwards uh, bending test uh, that um, appears here uh, when uh, the, uh, the deformity increases and uh, the discrepancy between the two parts 
uh, or the two halves of the uh, of the chest wall uh, appears like uh, like a hump like uh, like here uh, that indicates that this is a fixed uh, curve or structural one there are other important uh, findings on physical exams you have to uh, to to look for leg length uh, inequality because this could be the reason uh, uh, this um, uh, girl or boy uh, are getting scoliotic uh, in order to uh, let one uh, short limb to reach the ground. Uh, midline skin defects uh, because it could be a part of spinal dysraphism. Shoulder height difference, uh, truncal shift uh, that denotes uh, decompensation of the curve. Uh, rib rotational deformity uh, or rib prominence because this is usually the most disfiguring and um, uh, and that's why um, uh, most of the girls at that age look for, uh, for surgical management. Waist asymmetry and pelvic tilt. Cafe au lait patches um, uh, for fear of neurofibromatosis. Food deformities because um, it's common um, uh, uh, and suggests uh, neural axis abnormality. And asymmetrical abdominal reflexes uh, because um, uh, then you need an MRI to rule out uh, syringomyelia. So uh, again, between these uh, two end vertebrae uh, is the famous Cobb angle that measures uh, the angle of scoliosis. This is important because uh, your red line here is usually 40 to 45 uh, degrees. That, uh, uh, that is the red line between uh, intervention and non-intervention. Um, uh, and then you have uh, the so-called apical vertebra, which is this, the, the, the apex of the curve. Uh, which is uh, the disc or vertebra deviated farthest from the center of the vertebral column, which is this uh, central sacral vertical line. So this is the apical vertebra. And then you have the neutral vertebra, which is rotationally neutral. So here, uh, this is the neutral vertebra. When uh, the, uh, uh, the spinous process distance to both pedicles is equal, so this is the neutral vertebra. And then the stable vertebra, which is the most proximal vertebra that is most closely bisected by, the, the, by this central line. So uh, uh, this is the uh, vertebra, most ver uh, proximal uh, vertebra, because these are bisected. This one is bisected, bisected again by the central uh, sacral vertical line. But this is the most proximal that, that is really bisected. So this is the neutral vertebra. So these are very important definitions. Uh, the lateral uh, exposure is very important as well. Uh, in order to have these parameters, these are very important. The pelvic incidence, the pelvic tilt, the lumbar low doses, and the thoracic kyphosis. And you've heard uh, during this course about uh, these parameters. I'm not going to repeat this. There's no time for that. But these are very important diameters that have to be taken in consideration because uh, uh, you need a balanced spine at the end of your treatment, whether it is operative or non-operative. So these parameters are very important. <clears throat> uh, what are the indications of MRI? Uh, you don't need MRI for everyone. Uh, you need it if, uh, if there is a typical curve pattern for fear that, is, uh, that there is um, uh, some uh, neurological um, um, uh, significant uh, neurological abnormality as well, rapid progression, excessive kyphosis, structural abnormalities other um, uh, in other parts of the body, food deformities, asymmetric abdominal reflexes for fear of syringomyelia, uh, and these are the indications of MRI. And it should extend <coughs> from the posterior fossa to the conus. The classifications uh, should serve uh, the purpose of being uh, uh, effective methods that I can describe the deformity to uh, some other surgeons or parents or family or put them in the record, but also they should guide me to the treatment plan. So this is the king or the king and, uh, and mu um, uh, uh, classification. Uh, which is uh, uh, very simply, I don't use it uh, that much. I use the other classification, uh, the linky classification. But it's, uh, it's um, uh, the first four types are describing uh, the curve when it is uh, either single thoracic, this is type one, the fixed structural one, or double thoracic, 
so two curves in the thoracic area that are really structural or double major one is thoracolumbar and the other one is thoracic or treble curves okay and these are the first four types what is the difference between a b and c is the um, uh, this uh, mid sacral line and how much deviated is the um, uh, lumbar spine uh, uh, from it so this is a b and c what are the type 5 and type 6 these are uh, the ones with uh, uh, the curve in the thoracolumbar or lumbar area only and they are all type c because they are uh, deviated from the midline uh, the link classification is, uh, is um, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm the most useful in my hands. Um, it takes in consideration three parameters. Uh, the label primary curve, so it's doing the same as King's, and then assign lumbar modifier, and then assign sagittal modifier. So uh, this is the step one. Step one uh, is seeing uh, where is uh, the real non-flexible curves. So I'll give some examples uh, to be able to classify. Uh, for example, main thoracic curve is happening in all types from one to six, except uh, uh, in type five, where the real structural curve is in the thoracolumbar area. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, when uh, the, uh, the major curve is in the proximal thoracic and main thoracic, so it's double thoracic, so that's it. So it's, even if it is present in the thoracolumbar area, it's going to be compensatory to make the patient able to look forwards. So this is the first uh, thing in linky classification. Uh, then the, uh, the next thing is the lumbar uh, spine uh, modifier. And uh, the steps of, uh, of doing that uh, uh, to classify is very uh, simple. First of all, you have to identify where is the apical vertebra. Uh, and we've talked about apical vertebra, so uh, here this is the apical vertebra, and then take this uh, central uh, sacral uh, line, and if this central sacral line is passing between the pedicles of the uh, apical uh, lumbar vertebra, so it bisects it, that's A. If it just touches one of the pedicles, it's type B, and if it is not touching it at all, it's type C. Then we have the thoracic which is the sagittal uh, uh, thoracic uh, measurement. Uh, it's the cup angle that we have just described between T5 and T12. Uh, if it is hypokyphotic, which is less than 10 degrees, normal 10 to, to 40 and uh, positive, um, sagittal thoracic modifier if it is more than 40 degrees. So uh, treatment is based on all this on skeletal maturity of patients, magnitude of deformity, curve progression. It could be an operative, bracing, operative like posterior spinal fusion, anterior spinal fusion, anterior and posterior spinal fusion um, together to prevent the so-called crankshaft shaft phenomena that I'm going to describe in a few seconds. Bracing, uh, I have a personal bias here. I'm, I'm not a bracing guy. I, uh, I don't use uh, much bracing uh, for the curves that are having uh, some flexibility. I use um, uh, physical therapy more. And uh, I think bracing is uh, causing a lot of psychological problems for those kids. And uh, that's even more dangerous than what scoliosis is going to do for them. Uh, but those who use uh, bracing, uh, I don't use them. Um, uh, recommend them for 16 to 23 hours per day. So um, put yourself uh, in the place of those kids uh, having to put this all this uh, time. You must get psychologically disturbed. Uh, and they use um, uh, braces like Milwaukee, TLSO, Boston, uh, Charleston bending brace. I'm not um, a big fan of, of those. Um, and uh, I'm just going to give definitions uh, they put for their success. Bracing success is defined as uh, less than five degrees curve progression every visit. And the bracing failure is defined as six uh, degrees or more curve progression or orthotic discontinuation. And this is what, what usually happens. Uh, and it can happen also with skeletal maturity. So we have to see uh, uh, where is the skeletal maturity to stop bracing. 
and usually uh, they are used uh, for um, uh, curves that are less than 40 or 45 degrees uh, if they work in their hands. Uh, I'm more advocate for surgery. Um, uh, posterior spinal fusion, um, let's talk first about the, the fusion uh, levels and then we will talk about the maneuvers. Um, uh, what are the goals? Our goals is um, uh, fusion should include enough levels to adequately maintain sagittal and coronal balance while being as minimal as uh, uh, and as safe as possible to preserve motion uh, or to preserve enough motion in that spine. Uh, typically, fusion is happening from invertebra to invertebra, but it, it depends upon um, uh, uh, what school uh, are you going to um, uh, to uh, to align to Harrington uh, recommended one level above and two levels below the end vertebra uh, if these levels uh, fall within uh, the stable zone uh, more technique recommended fusion to the neutral vertebra uh, we have described that uh, linky recommended including all major curves in the fusion and minor curves that are not flexible or are kyphotic uh, Cochrane um, uh, reviews uh, said that stopping at L5 and L4 to a lesser extent is not giving uh, favorable um, uh, results. So in these uh, cases only, uh, you need to, um, uh, to uh, th there's another one coughing in the room. That's, that's perfect. I've infected someone. Uh, yes, I'm talking about you. Uh, this is one of my assistants in the studio. Uh, so, um, uh, if you have to stop at L5, it's better to go to the pelvis, like I'm, uh, I'm showing you here, to the iliac spine, to the iliac um, uh, bone, and uh, to a lesser extent to L4. But for myself, if I need to extend to L4, I go to the pelvis, uh, and that's another personal bias. Um, uh, curve correction um, uh, is done by a lot of maneuvers. Uh, these are the reduction maneuvers, distraction compression, simple rod rotation, simultaneous rod rotation, rod translation by persuaders, direct vertebral rotation, cantilever bending technique, and vertebral co-planner alignment. Uh, this is an example of correction only using uh, compression and distraction. So you're going to compress uh, the convex side and distract the uh, concave side. And this is uh, another method. Uh, after application of the uh, of the screws, uh, you apply uh, uh, you 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 contour the rod into the proper alignment like this, and then put it in the deformed uh, position. And then the whole rod gradually until it comes to the corrected position. Also, you can do this segmentally by use of, uh, of these towers uh, to segmentally derotate uh, uh, the uh, most rotated uh, segments. And this is a very effective method as well. This is, uh, again, compression and distraction. And you can put uh, the rod and then bend the rod itself. Uh, I'm not a very big fan of, uh, of this cantilever bending uh, or in situ bending. Uh, maybe to do uh, some fine tuning, but uh, not to do the whole uh, maneuver because uh, uh, of uh, the uh, decrease in the pull out strength of the screws uh, using uh, this method. Uh, you can uh, uh, translate uh, the rod uh, by persuaders uh, to be attached to the screws, and this gives a translation of the spine towards the, uh, the uh, construct, and then the vertebral co-planner alignment when you put the screws on both sides and then uh, put the towers on one side, connect them to a polyethylene uh, rod which is strong enough to align uh, the, uh, the spine and then put the rod on the other side in the corrected position and then uh, put another rod on the other side later after removing these towers. Uh, we have anterior spinal fusion and instrumentation. Uh, it gives better correction, uh, saving more um, segments for, uh, from fusion, uh, but it increases uh, the risk of pseudoarthrosis and increased uh, thoracic uh, hyperkyphosis uh, possibility. And there is uh, a technique that's gaining popularity now, which is uh, tethering uh, the convex side, putting the screws 
like this. Uh, these are anterior screws uh, because uh, when you uh, have this anterior approach, uh, either uh, either transpleural or uh, retropleural, um, you put these screws from side to side uh, to the vertebral body, and then uh, they put like a, 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 a polyethylene um, a tube that connects these screws together and then compress this convex side. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of growth modulation with uh, the convex uh, side vertebral body compression and then wait for, for skeletal maturity uh, and uh, then remove uh, your implant. Uh, uh, neurological monitoring, it's, uh, it's becoming um, uh, either the uh, uh, somatosensory evoked potential or motor evoked potentials. Uh, it's the standard of care. Uh, neurological event defined as drop uh, in amplitude to less than 50 uh, uh, percent. If neurological injury occurs intraoperatively, consider check uh, for the techniques, your screws, uh, check the blood pressure, hemoglobin, lessen or, re uh, or reverse correction and uh, do stagnara uh, wake up test which is the golden standard and if not remove the uh, instrumentation if the spine is still stable uh, complications neurological injury paraplegia in one uh, out of every thousand cases uh, these are the statistics of the united states uh, in the Middle East, uh, we don't have enough um, statistical data for that. Um, uh, there is increased risk also of kyphosis, excessive correction, um, and paraplegia is, uh, is more happening if you're using sublaminar wires because you're intra-canal. Uh, uh, pseudoarthrosis in 1-2% to of cases, infection 1-2% to of cases, Flatback syndrome, um, uh, which is uh, giving uh, the patient real hard time uh, with need of uh, revision surgery with osteotomies. Crankshaft phenomena is a rotational deformity of the spine created by continued anterior spinal growth in the setting of posterior spinal fusion only. Can occur in very young patients with only posterior spinal fusion uh, when performed alone and the anterior column is allowed to continue growth, uh, to continue its growth and it's avoided by performing anterior discectomy and fusion with posterior fusion in very young patients. Uh, superior mesenteric artery, uh, artery uh, syndrome, which is a compression of the third part of duodenum uh, due to narrowing uh, of the space between uh, this um, superior mesenteric artery, artery and the aorta. Uh, usually it's temporary and presents by symptoms of bowel obstruction in the first postoperative week. Uh, and it's treated uh, by uh, IV fluids until it goes away. Also hardware failure and uh, rod breakage uh, that indicates pseudoarthrosis. And by this, I thank you so much and I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you very much. So that was all. Uh, I know it, uh, it, it is um, uh, rapid and uh, it has a lot of information, but you have a handout in front of you uh, that contains all these slides and I'm happy to receive any questions.